have to wake up frequently and things will come to my mind regarding this church and it settles in upon me. You are responsible. You know, I feel kind of like the founding fathers of America did. They didn't know whether it was going to work or not. And sometimes in the flesh, sometimes it comes to your mind and you begin to think, oh, what if we fail? And then the Lord comes to me and says, it's not any of your business. Did I call you here? Yes. Are you doing what I ask you to do? Yes. Then you leave the results up to me. Amen. And that's all I need to know. But let's not allow self-doubt to make us like the man with the one talent. And let's not live in fear and say, I'm not qualified. You know what? God knows exactly what He wants you to do. And if you're not currently qualified, He'll make a way where you will be. Because that's the God we're serving. He's so much bigger than the world and the mindset sometimes we struggle with. Another one is self-pity. I failed in the past. You know, if we were to be honest this morning and have a hand-raising session, everybody here has failed at something. And you know what? If we were to be really honest, everybody here has failed a bunch. Don't look so pious. I might ask you to stand and testify. Everybody here has not met the full will of God in your life. Does that mean we have to live in defeat? No, that's not what I'm ascribing to. But I am saying that you don't have to live very long before you realize that one step out of the great grace of God is a step into the failure that comes from being without it. But you know, some people say, I, I failed in the past. That's kind of like going to a lousy restaurant and eating a meal that tastes like cardboard with pepper on it and saying, you know, this meal is so terrible, I'm going to never eat again. Isn't that funny? Some people do that spiritually. They have a failure or they have a church situation that hurt them or something and they say, you know what, I I'm done with it. I'm done with it. But you know what? You know, just as we would never say or let it cross our mind, I'm never eating again after this bad experience here at you know, Flambeau Steakhouse. I'm never going to eat again. Of course we are. You know, we might even say, you know what, this is so bad, we need to go somewhere and find some good food to get the taste out of our mouth. And that's what we need to do spiritually. We need to seek God. He will bless us. He will help us. My prayer is that this church will leave a good taste in your mouth. Because we're seeking God. And we're seeking to build up God's people. The last one is self-consciousness. And there's one more that I'm going to mention as well. People will think I'm crazy. Oh, this church, is they just, they're demanding things. They're asking things. They're, they're wanting me to be, come to a ministry fair. They're wanting me to do this. Folks, let's stop thinking like we used to think. Let's stop thinking. We're just going to sit in our comfort zone until Jesus comes. That's not what God called us to do. Jesus, when He left, He didn't say, Now, disciples, you will go to the synagogue and sit there faithfully until you're 90 years old and pass on your eternal reward. That's not what Jesus told them to do. He said, I want you to go into an upper room for their own protection, for one thing. He said, and then you tarry until you are endued with power from on high. And then He said, you will be witnesses unto Me. In Jerusalem, hometown, Judea, surrounding area, Samaria, across the tracks. I'm going to destroy all your prejudices. And then he said, to the uttermost parts of the world. Folks, we have to realize that it is a sin against Almighty God to sit in our churches and do nothing. God is calling us to go forward. Invest your life. Don't just waste it or spend it, but invest it in the kingdom of God. The last one is self-preservation. God, don't ask of me what I'm not willing to give. Oh, I get excited when I hear about other people's kids getting called to preach and when I hear about somebody else who went to the mission field. But Lord, don't you call my kids. Lord, don't you ask my kids to go over there and starve to death in Zimbabwe and be chased by lions and people with spears. Lord, don't you do that, Lord. Self-preservation. Folks, God owns everything we have. You know, it may be hard for us to comprehend, but even those beautiful little children that we hold in our arms and they grow up stepping on our toes and then they grow up and step on our heart, 
Those beautiful little children, they were given to us by God. And the safest, most sane thing we can do is say, Lord, I give them back to you for your honor and for your glory. Yes. Because they're not really ours. They're God's. Principle, or, or let, let's ask the question, how can we serve God without fear? This is important. 1 John 4.18 says this, there is no fear in love. Let me stop here and say this. Entire sanctification is perfect love towards God. If you have that, your performance will never be entirely perfect, but it will improve drastically. You know, if you really love someone, and you're going through as, as a young person, you know, you, you, may, you may treat this person this way and this person that way, but if you really love that person, you're going to do a lot of strange and silly things that make adults snicker. You're going to do crazy things to be with them. And you know, God says, I want you to love me that way. There is no fear in love. You know why we fear God sometimes? Because we know in our hearts that we still have other things we love more than Him. He says, ah, I want all of your deepest affection. It says that perfect love does what? It casts out fear. If that servant would have really loved his master, he wouldn't have buried that talent in the ground. He would have invested it. But he was afraid. He said, because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. And then in verse 19, it's talking about how much we love Jesus. We love Him because He first loved us. We serve God without fear by loving Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's a verse of Scripture from the Old Testament. If you love God with all of your heart and soul, that's where it begins. But then it begins to transform your mind. It said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You don't get saved in your mind first. You get saved in your heart and your soul. And then God begins to change the way that you think. Because as long as you've been living out there in the world, you've learned to think like the world. There are too many Christians today who think like the world. And God says, I want you to think biblically. And so He begins to transform our mind. And then, what happens? We use our strength for Him. You know what? You don't have to serve God in fear. God wants you to serve Him in perfect love. Some people think you've got to dance through hoops to be saved and sanctified, but what you have to do is you have to have God to forgive your committed sins. He deals with our inherited nature, but He fills us with His love. That's what God wants to do in your life. And in That's how we serve God without fear. We don't serve God without fear by, by being at everything the church has. You won't be able to do that. I can't even do that. We've created a monster here. There's so many things going on. I, can't, I don't even know what happens sometimes. Kind of like that. I know what's going on, but, but I'll tell you what. We, we serve God without fear because we just know that we love Him more than anything else. That's why your personal prayer at life and communication with Jesus is more important than anything you do for this church. That's why your personal time of getting into the Word and saying, Lord, open it up to me, that's why that's the most important thing. Because we love it. Principle number six. I love this one. Compensation. If I use my talents and gifts, I will be rewarded. You say, preacher, are you preaching health and wealth? No, I'm preaching the words of Jesus. Hang on. Verse 21 said, His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I see affirmation here. He said, well done, faithful servant. I want to hear Jesus say those words someday to me. Because He is the one I'm living for. He's the one I'm working for. He's the one I'm seeking to please. But then He not only promises me affirmation, He promises me promotion because He says, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Every church in the world should seek to be growing because God is a promoting God. 
You know what the goal of Jesus Christ is? To take over the world again and remake it for righteousness. That's why he came down and died. That's why the devil looked at him and said, Okay, Jesus, I'll make you a deal. Instead of going to that bloody old cross, you just fall down and worship me and I will give you these kingdoms. Remember that? Because the goal of Jesus Christ was to come and to take back from the devil what Satan had taken away. God wants this church to go forward, to press forward, to grow. Not because we're just interested in numbers, but because He wants us to take souls back whom Satan has robbed. He wants us to take them back for His honor and for His glory. Do you want to be a part of that this morning? If you do, say amen. amen. I want to be a part of that. And then the last thing is celebration. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know, there's times in my life down here when I, the Lord just gives me a little touch, a little taste, sometimes even a little more than that, of His glory and His celebration. It wasn't just this past week. I was in here in the sound booth working on this sermon and, and I had some music going and, and uh, I was kind of focused in on what I was doing and all of a sudden a particular song came on and you know, I don't even remember exactly what it was now, but I just found tears just rolling down my face because the words to that song just begin to resonate in my heart and I begin to feel the glory and the presence of God. And I just begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for a little taste of your presence today. I needed that. I needed that. <laughs> you know, there are times in our life, you may find this a bit humorous, when you go to a doctor for an annual checkup. And he or she will often begin to poke and prod and press in various places all the while asking, does this hurt? Don't you hate that? How about this? Poke. And if you cry out in pain, one of two things happens. Either the doctor pushed too hard without the right sensitivity or there's something wrong in that area and needs to be checked out. And you know, maybe the Lord is poking on you this morning. The thing about the great physician Jesus Christ is that He never pokes too hard and He never pokes in the wrong places. He always comes and He pokes right where we need it. And if it hurts this morning, He didn't do that to hurt you. He did that so the hurt could be pointed out and healing could be applied. And you know, folks, as we head into our future as this church, God, we don't know what all He's going to do. Uh, I talked to my brother recently and we were talking about some of the things that we're doing and, and I said, uh, do you have an overall plan for what has happened? You have to know we Keatons. He said, no way, man. He said, I don't even know what God's doing half the time around here. He said, I hear about a revival that broke out in this small group and how they lasted four hours instead of one. He said, and how they begin to pray and weep. He said, I hear about how somebody got saved in this small group. He said, I don't know what's going on. He said, this is God's plan. He said, I'm just kind of hanging on for dear life. And you know, that's okay with me. I don't have to be in charge of everything because it tells me that God is in charge. And God will do things in this church if we will let Him. And if we will say, I want to be a part. And if we will be willing to invest ourselves, that will surprise us beyond our wildest imaginations. Because God is a mighty God. Amen. And He's a conquering general and leader. And He's leading us. We're just a little bitty part of the biggest thing the world has ever seen. I know I've gone a little longer today, but I'm just so thankful in my heart that I have the opportunity to give myself to Jesus. And what I want you to do today is I want you to commit with me. We're going to have a word of prayer before we take our offering. But I want you to commit with me that you will give yourself, invest yourself, allow the Lord to invest the talents and gifts that He's given you in His work. Father in Heaven, we thank You for the Holy Spirit of God that is constantly leading us forward. Lord, You never lead us in circles. And you never lead us backwards.